thank you. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. My name is John Baker. I'm from Telemagic. I hope my Canadian accent isn't that obvious. Uh, I may intermix uh, Z and Z because, as you quite, might imagine, in Canada, I spend a fair bit of time south of the border and try to accommodate where we am. But in any event, we're going to talk about flash technology this morning. Uh, as Nigel mentioned, uh, from a vendor neutral perspective, whether you're using IBM, Hitachi, EMC, doesn't much matter to me. Uh, it's more a case of a uh, little bit of background of how it works. Agenda, pretty straightforward. What's in a name? I have a little bit of fun with the name. Flash, the name is used in many different ways, which we'll talk about. Some history and how it works. Uh, and of course, Flash is a storage medium, which is a primary purpose, replacing disk drives. Uh, a little bit of advertising, if you don't mind. Uh, three sessions this week, bouncing around a little bit from uh, storage this morning, this afternoon, talking about tailor fit pricing. Again, from, I think, a, a quite nice vendor neutral perspective, um, whether you want to go down that road or not. Uh, and then tomorrow, talking about uh, a little bit of hardware basic performance on Z14, Z15, or really any box for that matter. So one of the things I learned when you want to put pictures in your presentations is you don't want to just Google something and, oh, that picture looks fine because, hypothetically speaking, I've heard that you might get emails from lawyers who would say that <laughs> we own copyright to certain things. So I've discovered Pixabay and other great sites like that, and I, which I highly recommend where all of these came from. So uh, I loved the Flash magazine when I was a kid, but I'm pretty sure I don't want to get sued by DC. Anyway, the point here is that the, the name itself, Flash, we have a character, we have a Flash on a camera. We have Flash drives, sometimes refer to them. So the, the name is used in many different ways, even though we're talking about a specific type of technology in this presentation. Um, we'll talk also about its use in the Keck in another way. Some basic terms um, most of you are probably familiar with, random access memory, read-only memory. Um, the, without going through these in great detail, I mean the main difference we're talking about Flash is that it's non-volatile. The purpose, uh, met one of the main design points behind that was that it does not require a power source. Just This is what makes uh, saving your pictures on your mobile phone possible. You could turn the phone off, everything's still there. Um, if you've been around any uh, period of time when you're doing some work on your, on your laptop and, and you forget to save it and the power goes off, well what happens? It goes away because it's in RAM, it's in random access memory which requires a constant power source. As soon as that source goes away, the data's gone. So, very useful. Not quite as fast, but still uh, non-volatile. Interesting history, if you haven't looked into this, um, Fujio Masuoka from Toshiba, a Japanese gentleman, uh, invented in 1984. So we think about this being relatively new technology. Surprised me as well. It's not really new. Um, what happened, as with many inventions, is it's the economics that have to get behind it. Something can be possible, but if it's not economically viable, then it's not necessarily going to catch on. Uh, one of my mentors I had the benefit to learn from was uh, Dr. Pat Artis. And Pat was talking about, you know, when they make chips, uh, we're at 14 nanometer technology today. Could we make it smaller? Well, yes, maybe, but we have to consider the cost to build the machine that can make those. And are you going to be able to sell enough of them to, to pay for the machine? So even if the technology exists, is it necessarily economically viable? Not necessarily always the case. Interesting story about the good doctor. He came up with this idea, uh, pitched it to Toshiba where he was working at the time. They said, eh, we don't really think it's going to go anywhere. Um, other large companies like Intel and so on said, oh, we really think this is going to go somewhere. And of course, the revenue numbers speak for themselves. Um, one of the interesting points, several years later, he went back into academia, actually, um, after pitching that. Nothing really happening at Toshiba. Went back to teach at university. I think he's in his 70s now. He's still with us. Uh, went back and sued Toshiba because it seems like this technology has done reasonably well, I think we might say. Uh, he got somewhere just short of a million dollars. Seems a bit unfair, actually. 
given what he, given the revenue. Anyway, um, in our context, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Interflies, Enterprise flash drives in 2008, so just about 10 years ago when we really started seeing them in, in data centers and, and that application. NAND versus NOR, you might hear these terms as well. Some people say NAND flash, and what's that mean now? Uh, I'm not an engineer, we're not gonna get into that level, uh, but if you are and you're familiar a little bit with uh, electronics and transistors, these are at their basic level based on gates. Uh, a gate is just like a light switch, opens and closes, has two settings. Um, and you have the NAND and NOR gates, which are used to build uh, different things within the chip. NOR-based and NAND-based flash are really just uh, named based on the way they look. It has nothing to do with the actual background. You Primarily, we're talking about NAND-based flash today. It's not really important to our discussion, but a little bit of trivia. Some basic principles. So, flash is a series of electronic memory cells. Simple picture here. Um, you can You've got everything on a die. You can, can have multiple planes. You've got blocks, blocks just like in a hard drive where I read and write individual blocks, not necessarily individual records. Uh, a page, I can read or write to a page, but there are some limitations that we're gonna talk about in a moment with that. A couple of flavors I'll refer to, single level, multi-level, triple level cell. You might hear these terms as well. So back in 08, when the enterprise, enterprise flash drives came around from EMC, everything was single level cell. Single level cell is, is um, it's the most reliable. This is where I would be wandering over and pointing at the screen, so I'm gonna resist doing that. Ooh, but you know what? No, pointer doesn't work on the TV, okay. My goodness, I'm just gonna have to adapt. We're just gonna have to adapt. So imagine we're pointing at the single level cell right now. This is what we're doing. So the single level cells, you see, um, two options, right? On or off, only got one, one bit, so two settings. What does that mean? That means in order to read the data in a single level cell, I just have to detect if a charge is there or not. I don't need a lot of precision. When I write something, I create a charge. When I read it, I want to read, is there a charge? And because there's only zero and one, that means there's a charge or there's not. I don't need to be able to level, to measure what level of charge, which means it's quite reliable. It means I'll say it can take a beating um, and still read. With multi-level cell, now I've got two bits, now I've got four options. In that case, now I need to be able to measure the level of charge uh, a little bit more difficult. And then triple, and they go on. They're, they're quad-level cells as well. This is how storage has expanded, flash storage has expanded in density, essentially. Same reason why you know, this, the same physical disk that fits in your, it's not disk anymore, sitting in your hand, um, you know, was a few gigabytes and now it's a few terabytes. It's more density in the same space using this technology. There's also 3D technology that I'm not gonna get into. But, of course, the difficulty with this is that uh, at, with many, many different levels there, I need to be able to level, uh, read the precise level of charge. And every time I write to the cell, it requires a fairly high voltage. It does do a little bit of damage physically to the transistors and it gets more and more difficult to read. And if I can't read the level of charge and I can't read the data, then the data's gone. And most data centers that I visited have a big problem with data loss and terms like that. They tend to get upset at IBM and their storage vendors when it goes missing. That's okay, this is not to scare you. They uh, <laughs> have addressed this. The problem with writes, as I kind of alluded to, when you write or update, a cell requires that fairly high electric charge um, and it does do some a little bit of damage to the cell. Also looking at the the scope here, I talked about the, the blocks and the pages. So a block, I'm gonna step briefly. One of these guys, I've got multiple pages within the block. Now I can read or write to individual pages, but I can't update a page. A page is, is an update. You you're going to write it in another blank place. And then the controller is simply going to say, okay, the new copy is here now. Ignore that old one. I'm not going to change that anymore. Um, if I'm directed to a block and there's no space, I have to erase an entire block. This is another limitation. I can't, you can't with flash technology erase individual pages. 
So you do have to have a lot of extra space, and that's one of the things we do. Um, you might have heard the term write amplification mentioned at the bottom here. This is an effect of having to write in multiple places. So let's look at an example of this. I have an initial write of 10 pages to a block here. I've got two empty blocks, a whole bunch of empty cells, green being erased, the light blue, now I've got some valid data. Then I add some more in the second. If I update these, again, in this example, what I've decided to do is update those initial 10. It's just simply going to mark the original 10 as dirty or bad or unused and write the new pages. So I'm continuing to fill up space. And it'll actually probably go to other blocks, but I'll show a later example to clarify that a little bit more. Uh, but the idea is this will co continue to fill up. Those dirty pages are, are still contain the old data, but the controller will say this is where the new copy is. Go to these new pages. Now let's fast forward a little bit and assume that this block gets filled up with new data. And now I want to update any one of these. Well, I'm going to have to erase that entire block. I have to copy all the valid data to a brand new block. This is very much, if you've uh, worked in Java at all, heard about garbage collection, this type of process this is similar to what we're talking about here. Um, eliminate uh, the dirty data that's not used, and then I've got a new uh, usable block. The original block is now empty. But over time, again, I'm updating that block. It's going to slowly damage these cells. So if I were to continue to write to the same block continuously, this is going to cause a problem. That block's not going to be usable. That does get addressed. So writing, also known as a, a program erase cycle, as I mentioned, this requires this fairly high voltage. It does damage the transistors. And flash memory is rated. Uh, you can look at this up, probably even if you look at a drive that you buy for your laptop or something. It'll have a PE cycle range on it that the manufacturer will warranty. And it might be 100, it might be 100,000, it might be more, uh, depending. Just a brief comparison. The single level, multi-level, triple level cell. So 100,000 program release cycles for a typical single level versus three in 1,000. So when you look at that, just ignoring the other variables for a minute, you think, well, why would I use anything other than single level? And certainly in 2008, that was the case. When enterprise flash drives came along with DMC, um, the line we would talk about then would say, yeah, I'll use uh, MLC maybe in my, my camera, but I'm only using single level in my data center. I'm not putting my mainframe data on anything else. And that certainly was the case then. Why would we then transition to these other uh, ones? Cost. It's money. Uh, a single level cell drive that's only you know a few gigabytes, whereas now we've got multiple terabytes. My friends at IBM tell me we're going to see 20. We're going to see 100 terabyte SSD, 100 terabyte SSD within five years. Fit in the palm of your hand, 100 terabytes. Remember when the controller held 100 terabytes not so long ago. It's staggering. But that's just capacity. You know, then there's what, how reliable is that going to be? And then just look at the performance even. Now, uh, you guys are in storage, you maybe look at RMF data, you might be familiar with some typical response time values. Think, okay, 25 microseconds, 50, 75. That's not bad, that's good. Um, the program time, so that's to write. Two to 300, six to 900, that's, that's a millisecond. That's a, that's a long time to write. Now that might not necessarily be toler tolerable, anybody? got an idea of why I might not care about that. It's nothing like morning sessions and throwing quizzes out there. Okay, so when you write to a controller in a mainframe environment, and this might be true in non-mainframe, but I'm not qualified about that, I wouldn't speak. But whether it's IBM, EMC, Attachy, doesn't really matter. You write to the controller's cache, and you write a second copy to non-volatile storage, so I've got two copies. And then I send back channel and device end. I tell uh, Zed, I tell the application that it's done. It's not on disk yet. It's going to get destaged asynchronously later. And it's going to be considering RAID, and it's going to be considering updates to the other ranks, and the controller will do that all very efficiently. But the point is, it's not done at the time. 
So I actually don't care. To a point, I don't care. I don't care until, if and until, I'm writing to the controller at a rate that is higher than the controller is able to destate. And then the controller's cache would fill up. And then you would see a fast write bypass, which is an old term. Some of you might have been around or recognized that, where literally we had little small caches. And you could go around it. You, you could issue the instructions. The instructions still be issued today, bypass cache. Controllers will all ignore it. There is no path around cache. But that response still could come back, and it would call it fast right bypass, because what it's saying is, I'm full. This is Scotty calling from the engine room now. I can't take it anymore. Stop. And, and you would actually get a long busy sent back up the channel saying, I, I can't take anymore. And this, that can hurt. The solution to that, by the way, is not more cash. Although, Tom Beretvis, another smart fellow I learned from over the years, used to say it doesn't matter what the question is, the answer is more cash. Setting that aside, <laughs> if you did run into that problem, the problem is really with your D-stage capability and, and the, the back-end balance. We'll talk a little bit about that. Also, the erase time. You know, quite large numbers, but for the very same reason, we don't mind. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about these, but anybody think we've, we're still using lots of single-level cells in our data center today? Yeah, no, we're not. And you'd think, based on these, uh, pretty much everything is MLC in the data center. You buy DSAK, you buy EMC Hitachi. I can see maybe there might be a, a higher tier, more expensive something like that. We're going to see tiers of flash. I'll talk about that in a moment as well. But addressing this program erase uh, issue. Now, I, I did fib a little bit earlier when I was showing that example that we were writing to the same block and then we were writing more to the same block. That's not actually what the uh, drive is going to do. The controller is smart. It knows that each of these cells has a limited lifespan primarily dependent on the frequency of writes. So it spreads them out. And wear leveling is a, probably the most common technique that all the vendors use. And it's simply like a shotgun scattershot approach, but it's not random. You'll actually be keeping track of, okay, how many writes has this cell absorbed? How many writes has this cell absorbed? And it'll spread them out all over the die, all over different cells and blocks. And again, simply keeping track using pointers saying, okay, this is my good copy right now. So there might be several old copies scattered all over the place. As long as I still have capacity, I have no need to, to erase those. I have no need to go through that exercise. So that's another area. The second point there, there's significantly more physical storage. If you buy a two terabyte drive, there is significantly more than two terabytes of physical storage within that drive, even whether it's in your laptop or in your controller. And just like with a disk drive, where it's not just reading the data, but detecting how good is this read? You know, am I, am I having to retry? Am I starting to get errors on this track? And it would mark a track as bad and say, don't put things in there. Similar thing here. Some of these cells start to go before it actually melts, <laughs> so to speak. It's going to say, ah, I had to try three times before I could get that data. Let's mark that cell bad. Let's not put anything there anymore. And then over time, the usable storage would start to diminish. This also seems a little bit scary. But back to Pat Artis. Pat said, I ran IO driver on one of these things for three months and, and didn't break it. So hey, if they're giving you a three or five year warranty, I think you're safe. I've never heard of anyone losing data. And at the end of the day, remember, we still got RAID. So even if you were to lose the entire drive, everybody's using RAID. And actually, now the standard is RAID 6. But Again, I'm getting ahead of myself. I should start talking about, I should move to the slide before I start talking about the slide. So MLC for enterprise, uh, triple level cell, I am hearing that when you start getting into the very high density, uh, if we're talking about a 10 or 20 terabyte drive, that's very likely going to be a triple level cell to allow us to get to that level of density. Single level for performance, maybe, again, um, Back in 08, there was a company called S-Tech. If any of you investors, this is one of those companies that you wanted to own then. It's gone now. I don't know if they're still around anymore, but I mean, they were the sole supplier for enterprise flash drives to EMC. Uh, 
you wanted to own that stock. That's eh, gone now. Intel and everybody else makes them. Maybe that will come back. Maybe there are going to be tiers, as I mentioned, uh, just as today where you've got your 7200, you've got your 10K, your 15K, and then you've got your flash. You're going to have tiers of flash in the future. And rate, of course. Question? Okay. Switch gears just a little bit, because again, we're talking about flash. Well, the term is used all over the place. We've been talking about flash cells, we're talking about flash drives. IBM has is, is never uh, said no to a good marketing campaign, so let's have Flash Express. Let's have virtual Flash. Well, what are these things? Well, if you've got an EC12 or a Z13, you might have Flash Express. What is Flash Express? These are solid state drives uh, that essentially when you, if, I was going to say, if and when you page, most shops don't page much anymore because we've got large central storage. There's not really necessarily a reason, but if you did, you might take dumps, you might have large uh, sorts, DB2 reorgs, things like that, that can cause you to go into auxiliary storage. Well, auxiliary storage has to go out the channel, down to the controller, and even if it is uh, flash drives in the controller, that's still a longer I.O. If I put these SSD drives right in the keck, in the EC12, in the Z13, I avoid all that channel activity, that's a lot quicker. Z14, Z15, enterprise, or enter, pardon me, virtual flash memory. What's virtual flash memory? Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is it's not flash memory. And maybe I'm picking on marketing people, but let's just call it that because flash is a cool term. Flash Express is solid state drives that is built from flash memory. Uh, Z14 and 15 virtual flash is not flash memory. But this is actually not criticism. What it is, is DRAM. If you order, as F15 today, and you say, I would like 12 terabytes of central storage and I would like 2 terabytes of virtual flash. They build the box with 14 terabytes of memory because it is literally the same stuff. Now, this is a good thing. Despite the name and a little bit of marketing, it's actually a good thing because it's really fast. Uh, this is RAM. This is uh, volatile memory. The, the data would be lost if power goes out. but of course, we know all the redundancies that we have in these KECs. That's not really a problem. If you were around for expanded storage, and remember that, this is kind of like expanded storage. I think they even resurrected some of those instructions to access it. So it's really fast. There's not even a start subchannel. There's, there's none of that. It will still use ASM. You don't have to make any changes to your applications to take advantage of it. Uh, you can't execute in it, even though it's the same memory, but it's moving memory to memory access. It's really, really fast, really good idea. Um, and it is, Flash Express is gone, by the way. So if you're on EC12 or Z13 and you're going to 14 or 15, the Flash Express option isn't there anymore. This is a nice stepping stone to where we are today with virtual Flash. I also, I'm not much into the uh, financials, but I understand it's a pretty good deal. It's supposed to be pretty cheap, and it's physically the same stuff. So I think it's a good investment. And while we're just on the subject of auxiliary storage, Here's a very fascinating chart with a single line on it that doesn't look terribly interesting. Um, this is one of our reports from Intellimagic Vision. Uh, shameless plug. Much, uh, much of the others are more exciting than this particular one. But if you work in a data center, sometimes boring is good, right? I like boring because that means the phone's not ringing and things aren't breaking. What I'm talking about here is not paging in terms of the activity and what that does to response time, because that can be an issue. I'm talking about storage occupancy. So because we don't page so much anymore, we might have kind of ignored our paging subsystem and say, well, yeah, I know there's some page packs out there, but I don't really pay attention to them because I don't care. All I'm in letting you know here is there's an old threshold that's still there. It's been around for a long time. You notice the shading at the top of our box, so we take care of this for you, but even if not, if you reach 70% utilization, and what that is is 70% occupancy, so whether you've got a single pack or you've got 100 mod 3s or you know, whatever it may be, if 70% of your auxiliary storage is full, and that would include flash if you're using part of that, you will get an IRA 500, something like that, to the master console, auxiliary storage shortage, address space create failed, the audible indicator of a problem, that device on your desk will begin to ring. It will not stop ringing. 
um, because your system has come to a screeching halt. You can run a mainframe at 100% busy, day and night, it'll be happy. Starve it of memory, it'll stop. It'll stop in a very unpleasant way. So simply all I'm saying here is have lots, just provision lots, even if it's not there, because you definitely don't want to hit that threshold. Um, notice the little green outline. If, if you get up into the shaded area there, that box will turn yellow. So if you're using telemetric vision, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Okay, let's get back to what we're talking about here. Flash is primary storage. Now, the good doctor from Toshiba, he did envision this is what we were going to do with flash storage. We're going to replace spinning disks. This, of course, is, is the inside of a hard drive. That is the inside of a solid state drive. With the covers on, they appear much the same. And if you plug it into either your mainframe or your laptop, this has got a solid state drive in it. It presents itself to the operating system as a spinning disk. You can issue the same instructions, seek and set sector. Of course, there are no moving parts in a solid state drive. There is no seek. <laughs> there is no RPS miss and all those things. That's all gone. Uh, it's all flash. But it can only do one I.O. at a time, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later. So let's look at candidates. Let's say in your environment, okay, I want to look at this flash stuff. Maybe, well, actually, maybe just quickly, how many of you have gone to all flash arrays already? It's becoming fairly common. Oh, none yet. Looking at it, though, thinking about it, trying to see if it's a good idea. I'm sure the, the uh, storage vendors are coming around saying this is a great idea. They're not wrong. I'm not here to, to bash, even though I'm vendor neutral. It's, it's good technology. There is the argument of, Will it help me? And that's what I want to talk about here. So if you're doing any analysis, whether you're using our tools or just the basic RMF reports, you want to look at random reads primarily. You want to look at high disconnect time. When you've done all your basic tuning and you've got some things, what I call cache unfriendly, or as Tom would say, you know, the answer is more cache. Well, if you've done all that and it's still down there at 70% hits or something, it's just not getting any better, this might be a candidate. So this is one of the areas you want to start, just looking at your, your basic response time. Um, I like to use the, the stack bars because I've got my iOS Q, my pen, my connect, my disconnect all stacked together so I can see my total response getting up in this case to uh, a millisecond at peak over there and then the IO rate. And primarily I'm focusing on that disconnect time. It's a, one of the best places to start. If I don't have any disconnect time, because that's primarily related to read misses, that means I'm servicing most of my IOs out of cache in the controller. That means I'm not really that interested in how fast what we call the back end is, the back end drives, uh, because I'm not getting them from there. It's in cache. It doesn't matter. Uh, if I have a read hit, I don't have to get it from the disk. It doesn't matter how fast or slow the disk is, essentially. You want to look at cache hit ratios. So that first chart, those are from your uh, type 74, subtype 1 records, response time. Uh, these are from the subtype 5s. So this is a little bit messy. Uh, you could look at this an entire controller level. You can break it down by LCU. This is by LCU within a given box. Again, the, the shading we do here, this is, of course, uh, an inverse type of thing. You, you want it to be high, not low, unlike response time. So 100% at the top says that 100% of my I.O. requests were serviced out of cache. There were no read misses. I did not need to go to the back end. As I mentioned earlier, writes are always hits, unless I'm getting into a back bypass cache situation. So it's these random reads where it wasn't found, I need to go back in. So you might want to filter some of these out and identify which volumes, which storage groups, which applications. Uh, DB2 is one of the more popular ones tend to be cache unfriendly and are these uh, targets for flash technology because this is the ones that are dependent on how fast can I get that data from the back end drive into cache. You can also break this down by type quite uh, often now within the controllers they'll have tiers already and might be using an, an easy tier or, or function like that that will automatically move the more active data so in this case, I've got some 10K, I've got some 15K, I've got some flash, and what I'm charting here is, is the relative back-end activity. Now this, I guess is, again, I'm bragging telemagic vision, but you can get this out of RMF. 
So this is a 74 subtype 8 record. So unlike the traditional I.O. rate that we know and love, start subchannel, uh, which includes cache hits, this is measuring back-end operations to and from the actual spinning disks or flash disks, whichever that is, um, within the controller. So from the back end to and from cache, moving things. Um, when you're talking about spinning disks, you can get a sense of, well, how many is that doing and how many is the flash doing? I mean, obviously you want the flash to be doing most of the work and most easy tier type of functions should take care of that for you. It should be automatically moving the busier data to the flash tier because they can sustain much higher I.O. rates. From the same record, you can get a back-end response time. This is extremely useful metric because this is not that traditional RMF response time that, again, includes cache hits. This is how long, on average, for each of these back-end ranks, uh, arrays, extent pools, whatever technology you're using within the box, how long, on average, does it take me to stage data from the back-end drives into cache? So if I have a cache miss, is it taking me 2, 5, 10, 20 milliseconds? You know, if it's 2, I'm probably pretty happy. If it's 20, maybe I'm not. And this is one of the reasons where when you look at a, a disconnect time measurement, that can be misleading because it's an average value. It's an average value of all IOs. So let's do another morning quiz. This is always fun. So if I've got a a disconnect time of one millisecond and I'm showing a 90% hit ratio, do we have a, a rough estimate of, of what percentage of IOs might have experienced, say, a one millisecond disconnect time? 10. Hmm. That's a good guess. Very likely none. So. Because of the average, it's a very misleading average, because 90% 90 of hits means you had 90% of the IOs that had a disconnect time of zero or next to zero. They didn't disconnect at all. They didn't go to the back end at all. Their disconnect is zero. And then the other 10% of the IOs had a disconnect time probably something like 10 milliseconds. So then the average of all of them is one. But it can be very misleading. Because what you had was a whole bunch of IOs that were just fine, and a handful that were really slow, really sp slow, relatively speaking. If 10 milliseconds is a long time for that application, are they screaming? So that would be that application would be a candidate for flash because it's more dependent on the speed of that backend. A 15 kRPM drive can't spin that data up as fast as a flash drive. So for that very small, very active, very cache unfriendly workload. Flash would help it. For the other 90%, it wouldn't matter. It doesn't really care. By the way, if you do look at these metrics in this record, 74 subtype 8, you will see that there's reads and writes in there, response time. I would ignore the write response time. It is recorded. But because writes are done asynchronously, they're sitting in cache. They're destaged later. Depending on the controller, depending on what it decides to report back to RMF, that could be a really long number, which might appear that there's some kind of problem. But of course, the controller has just chosen not to destage that right away. The read numbers are absolutely useful, though, because this is a demand. This is an application that said, I want something right now. It wasn't in cash. Go get it. The controller is going to get it as fast as it can. So when you see really big numbers here, what this indicates is that particular rank or array is getting busy. There are a large number of requests there. Doesn't mean the disks are spinning slower, just means there's a lineup, there's a queue. We also do some of our own analysis for SSD candidates, uh, helping you track read miss rates and backend drives and uh, operations. So let's talk about the money, because Again, this is usually what comes into play, not just the technology. Getting back to Pat's point, yes, maybe we can do this, but is it economically viable to do this? If you've bought storage over the years, quite often you'll go to your boss and you'll say, okay, what's the cost per gigabyte today? That's the way we would buy things. Interesting quote from the uh, uh, VP finance of, of Seagate. I, I 
thought this was interesting. I'll never foresee the day when there's a crossover between the per gigabyte cost of NAND and rotating magnetic media. What he's saying is, in his opinion, spinning disks will always be cheaper than flash disks. Like, that's a, that's a brave quote. I'm not sure I would want to debate with the VP of Seagate. He's, he's probably done a lot. But uh, look at some numbers. Um, not sure how well this is showing up back there. I apologize. I definitely will post the slides, but um, talk to a, a couple of relevant numbers. We don't need to go back to 1965 because they're not terribly relevant to NAND flash. NAND flash didn't come on the scene until 2000. Uh, and primarily what we're looking at is the cost here, dollars per gigabyte for spinning disk and for flash. So I go back to 2000. $7.70 a gigabyte for spinning disk, $1,255 for NAND flash. Yes, it exists. Economically viable, not so much. $1,200 a gigabyte. I don't think your boss is going to approve that. You can say, oh, look how fast this is, and he'll say, I don't care. You're, any of you ITIL certified? Got to be some. So ITIL has a, a, a number of different sections. There's finance and their capacity planning. And in my experience, I found what is the uh, comparison between finance and capacity planning. Capacity planning is where you tell them what you need. Finance is where they tell you what you're getting. This is the world that most of us live in. This would be the case in, in, in 2000. You can say, I need this NAND flash. You'll say, you're getting the spinning disk. Make it work. You're a smart lad. Okay. 2005, 79 cents for spinning disk, all the way down to $42 for NAND flash. Getting better. Trend continues all the way up to uh, this 2017, the most recent uh, values that I have. Two cents a gig spinning disk. Dirt, dirt cheap. 30 cents for flash. Still cheap compared to 1,200. So it, it got viable. If you think about uh, that EMC breakthrough 10 or so years ago, so 08. In 2010, it was $1.75 a gigabyte versus 10 cents. So quite a premium. But that's where you could build a case just as we did with memory uh, years ago when we started putting cash in the controllers where we'd say, okay, I can afford this small amount of cash memory for this very important uh, application uh, that requires that speed, but I can't do it across the board. Now we're talking about all flash arrays. We're doing it all across the board. There's a couple other considerations. Yes, the prices continue to drop for both. Um, SSD adoption fuels demand, which fuels innovation. I have a 250 gig solid state drive in this laptop. This laptop is five years old. I didn't buy it because I said, oh, I have to have this flash drive. I bought it because it was there. It was about the same price anyway. It's not going to be worse, so why not? Uh, it, the spinning disks are just kind of going away that way. I've been hearing for many years that 15K is dead or 10K is dead. Uh, all three tiers are still there. I, I can't believe they're still there. I can't believe that they're all going to survive. One or more of them has to drop. I don't think it's going away. But we don't need 7200 and 10K and 15K and multiple layers of flash. It's just not sustainable. Those factories are going to start shutting down. And then you think about RAID. Now, I'm a confessed, admitted mainframe bigot. But those four fellows from Berkeley, when they came along and said, with this RAID idea, said, oh, do away with those big spinning drums of yours. You know, we're going to give you these cheap little drives, and, and they're going to be way better. And we're like, come on, that stuff's not reliable. Get that away from me. That we're, we're mainframe people. We want storage that works, storage that we can count on. Yeah, but there's going to be so many of them. Half of them are going to break. Yeah, so what? They'll break, and we have more, and, and, and you won't care. It seems crazy. It seems, you know, cowboy mindset to this mainframe fellow. And yet, isn't that what we do? That's what we do. Your storage controllers today, your multi-million dollar boxes are filled with these cheap little drives, and they break all the time, and we don't care because we have RAID. So I, I, I tend to think, okay, this is probably going to work. Environmentals, this is the one subject I haven't touched on yet. So you might think when you look at those cases for performance benefits, and you look at a, a typical mainframe environment that has a 90%, 95% hit ratio. We are quite blessed in the mainframe world. 
our hit ratios are very good. This is not the same. If you work in the distributed world as well, if you're familiar, that's a much bigger challenge. They might get 50%. Um, one of my first instructors said MVS is the fastest I.O. pump in the world. I think he's probably right. Um, but because of that, we don't need this. And I guess that's what I'd say is, I'll call it the dirty little secret. This flash memory isn't for us. It wasn't invented for mainframe. We didn't have an I.O. problem. We got 0.2 milliseconds response time off a spinning disk. We got 95% hit ratios. There's no need. It's not filling a need. Um, whereas when you've got 50%, when you're really dependent on that back end speed, and of course all the explosion in the distributed world, they really, really need this. We're getting it because that's where the bulk of the manufacturing is going anyway. And it's not worse. So you might say, well, why would I even bother? Why you might bother is the environmentals. In a large storage controller from any vendor that's filled with dozens, if not hundreds, of spinning disks, those spinning disks are by far the largest consumer of electricity, the largest generator of heat, requiring cooling. Um, and if you're in a large shop, a large data center with many large storage controllers all over the place, those electricity and cooling costs can start to become an issue. And I've seen large data centers that had no performance need for flash memory, but have gone all flash arrays across the board simply because of the long-term environmental benefits. They run cheaper. They run cooler. Uh, they last longer. And then finally, dollars per I.O. So we talk about dollars per gigabyte. You might think, well, that's, that's a space metric. How much space do I need? Well, I might also need to consider, well, how much activity do I need to sustain? It's fine to buy a 20 terabyte drive. Uh, I can buy, I can buy a, a 15K drive at, at 600 gig. Let's say I could buy one at two terabytes. They wouldn't make one at two terabytes. But could I do more IOs? No. It's the same performance. So let's look at this. Access density. Anyone still look at access density? This is something we need to do. IOs per second per gigabyte of storage. This was very important as drives began to grow in density. When I had 36 gig, 73 gig drives, life was good. They were small. I didn't have that much data on it. They're all very busy. When I went from, say, a 73 gig to a 300 gig, say they're both 15K. The 15K drive has got to be 15 years old now. But say I make that leap. Well, now it's, it holds four times as much stuff. But it's the same two and a half or three and a half inch platter spinning at 15K RPM. It can't do any more IOs per second. The 300 can't do any more than the 73. It can hold four times as much. So if I took the workload from four 73 gig drives and say they were each doing 100 IOs a second, for argument's sake, I consolidate them onto one 300 gig. Boss is happy. So now I got one drive instead of four. That's cheaper. That runs cheaper. It's, you know, consolidation and all that. But now if the applications haven't changed, well, now I have a single drive that's trying to do 400 IOs per second. 15K RPM drive won't do 400 IOs per second with any degree of performance. It just won't. That was a little bit of a side story, but we'll take about this hypothetical here. So say my requirement is 10,000 IOs per second rather than so much space. I just need to be able to do 10,000 IOs per second. And I'm gonna go with spinning disk. Well, 15K RPM, I'll tell you, can do about 200 and, and maintain decent performance. You get over that, you're gonna start to see a queue. So I, that means I need 50 disks, whether I need the space or not. And the 73s have gone away, and the 300s, I think, are gone away. And you, you know, you're probably into 600 now, but in this example, I've still got 300s. But at 300s, that means I need to buy 50 disks. Maybe, it, maybe my application is two terabytes. It's not 15 terabytes. But I need to do 10,000 IOs per second, so I have no choice. I have to buy all these disks to be able to do that. So I've got 15 terabytes that are probably half empty in this particular case. Or I could buy a few flash drives, SSDs, at three terabytes each. I just I don't see, getting back to the gentleman from Seagate, I don't see how spinning disks can compete at this level um, when they can do thousands of IELTS per second. They just don't have that limitation. So all flash arrays, well, why haven't we seen these yet? 
Um, you'd think that we would have actually started seeing this sooner. Well, traditional controllers, your DSAK, your EMC, your Hitachi boxes, these were designed for spinning disks. So yes, can I take, just as I did in 08, can I take a flash drive and plug that in to the same SATA interface of a spinning disk? Yeah, I can do that. Will it work? Yeah. And can that disk do many more aisles per second than the spinning disk it replaced? Yes, it can. But think about a controller that has hundreds of slots like that. And it's doing, you know, 50,000 aisles per second for argument's sake, the spinning disk. And I replace all those spinning with flash drives, which can now do 10 times as many aisles per second, times 100 of them. Do I now think that controller can do 10 times as many hours per second? No. This is one of the things that the storage vendors are catching up on, and they're making great progress. But it's been a, a matter of some of these other components, the weakest link, if you will. So flash drives provided this great leap ahead, but the surrounding infrastructure uh, still couldn't get there. Anybody looking at something like Z Hyperlink? This is not really related to flash drives, but it's, it's a similar type of idea where I'm getting the data to the, the CPU faster through this dedicated link. I'm bypassing a lot of that other infrastructure. I'm not going to the I.O. subsystem in the Keck. I'm not going out channels. I'm not dependent on all these other pieces, SAS interfaces and so on. Lastly, NVMe. Anybody heard of this? If you're played around. I had to Google. I didn't know that this has been under development in 2007. And this is like the thing. This is the next big thing. Um, this is a protocol that's specifically designed for flash memory. It's not in your DSAK yet. Uh, one of the other vendors does have it. Storage vendor has it today. Again, there's an argument that it's not necessarily needed in the mainframe space, but it's absolutely welcome in the distributed space. The main point that caught my eye right here is the 64,000 Qs versus one. So think about that spinning disk. If it's 15K RPM, so 50,000 RPM, whatever, you can bank it, spin as fast as you can. Well, you, you can't. They ran it, they tried. They tried to get to 20, they couldn't. I know people way smarter than me that tried and they couldn't get there. Um, but regardless of that speed and regardless of how fast you can make that head move, it can only be in one place at a time, at any instant in time. It can only get one piece of information. Whereas a flash drive with no moving parts, with thousands of cells throughout it, in theory, if you were to allow it to have multiple lanes, it could service multiple concurrent requests. So when it's using a standard disk drive protocol like SAS or SATA or SCSI, it's only getting one request at a time. The drive itself is not doing its full potential, essentially. This is what NVMe allows. 64,000 concurrent, yes, it staggers my mind as well. You know, we didn't just go from one to two or one to 10. Or, no, we went from one to 64,000, are you kidding me? Uh, I suspect this will also run into one of those surrounding infrastructure delays before we're suddenly doing 64,000 times as many. Of course not. Um, I'm not sure that the machine will get there. But it, it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's very exciting. And it certainly you know, removes that, that limitation uh, because the drive itself doesn't care. If you could ask for data from 64,000 different cells at once, it'll give it to you. Um, I think it might quite literally be the, the next big thing. Yeah, it's, it is out there already in a primarily non-mainframe controllers, but if you look around, all the big storage vendors are into this stuff. I just ordered a new um, ThinkPad. Uh, and it had NVMe in it. I don't know if I'll actually see a benefit or not. It's using Windows, who knows, but I'm at the end. I'm ahead. Uh, any questions just before we wrap up? You know, we kind of bounced around a little bit there. Clear as mud. Oh, oh, oh. 22, oh, okay. Charts. <coughs> that one. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, what I've done here, this is a response time. This could be for an entire controller, average, for example. But the way it's recorded in the RMF data, this is done for each logical volume. So the 74 type 1 record will record the start subchannel rate, which is a little line, the response time components at a volume level. Uh, the type 42 records will give you data set level statistics, similar metrics, and the address space that also did that access. So that's very specific. You can also wrap these up by storage group. Typically in most shops, they're not doing individual volume placement. You've got a large SMS storage group, and this does the DB2, this does this application, this does that application. So you can certainly group them that way. I mean, we do that within Telemagic Vision, so you can kind of slice and dice and say, what's the response time of this particular area, this entire box, this storage group, or, yeah, right down to the individual volume. You can do that. This one is a 74.5. This is from the perspective of the, the controller itself. So whereas this response time is by LPAR, it's measured from an LPAR perspective, you'd actually want to combine these because you very likely have multiple LPARs accessing shared disk. So if you only look at an RMF report from one LPAR, for one thing, you're not seeing the total I.O. rate. You're only seeing the I.O. rate from that LPAR. And you want to know how busy is that actual volume. For that, you want to go to the 74.5 record, which you can collect on each LPAR, but it'll be the same data. The 74.5 provides hit ratio. Um, it tells you if it's a read or write. So a start subchannel on the LPAR record, you go through that 74.1, there's nothing telling you if it's a read or write. It just says an I.O. This tells you if it's a read or write, tells you if it's a hit or miss, tells you if it's sequential or random and gives you what you call a locate record, which is not a start subchannel, but it's like an I.O. from within the controller. And that gives you a single metric of how busy is this volume, irrespective of the L part it's coming from, because it doesn't actually care. It's how busy is this volume? And then you can associate that back with, well, what volume is that? What storage group does it belong to? You can cross-reference that with the type 42 records, which will give you the volume and give you the data set and give you the address space. Absolutely. So you're like advertising for me, buddy. <laughs> so we have built-in thresholds, um, these shading areas, and, and these will change color from green to yellow to red, and you can have it set up automatically. Or you can change the thresholds as well. You can specify, you know, for these volumes, for these groups, this is what I'd like to warn me about. Automatically send out an email or, or a message if, if this goes over such and such a value, anything like that. Ah, well, yeah. Now, <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the question. I don't want to. I don't want to get into too much. Of, Advertising. This is not a telemagic session, but come see me in the booth. Um, there's a lot that we do because obviously the RMF data is is voluminous. There's there's a lot of good statistics in there, but of course putting those together and giving you intelligent answers requires intelligence, and that's kind of what we do. But yeah, come visit me in the booth. Happy to talk about it. Um, yeah, you, you do have to find a way to uh, make sense of a lot of the statistics. A lot of it does require combining records and then deriving intelligence and correlations and things like that, and yeah. we do all that within it. Yeah, yeah, we have dashboards and... Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, so if you have a failure, I mean, the drive will spare out. So what happens in a RAID environment, the drive, the drive breaks, uh, the application th theoretically is transparent. It will continue to do IOs by getting the data from the re remaining drives in the array plus the parity, assuming it's using parity or, or RAID 1, which would be a full mirror. Uh, in the background, uh, that will get spared out, meaning the data is going to be copied to another drive. IBM or EMC, whoever it is, is going to come in and replace that drive, plug it in real time. The data gets copied back. Um, 
If you're familiar with RAID, you might have noticed that the standard went from RAID 5 to RAID 6. The reason it went to RAID 6 is because of the time of rebuilds. So when you had 73 gig drives, that's 73 gigs worth of data, it doesn't take that long to fill up one of those. When you've got multiple terabyte drives, and if you've got an array of say eight, which is common, you've got eight of those drives in an array. One of them is parity if you were RAID 5. One fails. You have to take the data and the parity from the other seven drives to rebuild what was on that terabyte drive that failed. That's going to take a long time. It's also still servicing applications, which are going to be a higher priority. It's going to be a background task. And that may take hours and hours and hours. During that rebuild time, until that disk has been completely rebuilt, that array is at risk. It's an exposure because RAID 5 can tolerate a single failure. If another drive were to fail before that rebuild is complete, that entire array is lost. Two terabytes times eight drives times your phone's ringing times your boss is calling times you're not going home. Um, bad. Because of this, although it's not required, I believe it's not required, but it's certainly recommended today, the standard has moved to RAID 6. RAID 6 has two parities. It means it can tolerate a double failure. Um, so you lose a little bit more space. You lose two out of your eight drives instead of one. But you can take a second failure during that rebuild, and that rebuild can take hours, and it's, it's really just a safety reason. If you've still got small drives and it's not that active, you can say, no, no, I'm good with RAID 5. And it'll work a little faster, because writes take longer with RAID 6, because they have to update both of the parities. So a single update to a record is updating the record and updating both parities. So that does generate more activity, but the trade-off is, is available. Yeah, that's why I know IBM in particular has said, everybody's going with these huge drives. We want you to use RAID 6, please. I'm pretty sure if you say, no, I don't want RAID 6, I want RAID 5, they're going to say, please sign this disclosure that you won't call us and <laughs> something bad happens. <laughs> that would be the guess. Okay. Well, appreciate the discussion. Um, just to wrap up, flash is portable memory of today. We would not have cell phones without it. We wouldn't have your, your I was going to say Blackberry. I'm showing my. <laughs> uh, as some say it's debatable if SSD will actually pass, but I think it's going to be a moot point anyway. Uh, if they're cheap enough, they don't have to be cheaper, and they're definitely going to be better. Uh, don't forget those environmentals. That's probably the biggest uh, if you've got any kind of sizable shop. And done questions. Please do submit your feedback. As uh, I appreciate it, as well as uh, Mark and, and Nigel, I know, uh, look for that. Um, always looking at your thoughts and how we can improve. And thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.